Hi, my name is Paul, and welcome to episode 11 of my monthly Wealth Simple Canadian Stock Portfolio series, where I invest $100 every month. Now, really quickly before I get into the video, I do follow a set of rules when investing in this portfolio, and I also have a set of goals that I'm trying to achieve. If you're someone who's interested in getting a better understanding of those, then I'd recommend going into the description box below this video where there'll be a document outlining everything in detail. Alternatively, you could just go back and watch the earlier episodes by clicking on the series playlist link, which also happens to be located in the description box. With that out of the way, let's go over what happened in the portfolio's fiscal October. At the start of the month, as per usual, I added $100 of cash to the portfolio. On top of that, I also received $1.87 in dividends over the previous month, and I also had one cent left over from investing during September. Last month, I was able to use all of that money to buy six Morgard North American Residential REIT shares, one share of Knight Therapeutics, and 0.1411 shares of MTY Food Group. As of the market's close on November the 3rd, 2022, that $101.88 that I invested has appreciated by 6.13% to $108.12 when accounting for the dividends that were received in the month. Starting with the smallest percentage gainer, which also happens to be the smallest holding within the portfolio, Knight Therapeutics shares increased by 3.21%, and this month, again, there was no major news regarding the company. That said, Knight will be announcing their third quarter financial results and conference call on Thursday, November the 10th. While I'm on that topic, unlike Morgard and MTY, I think that Knight's earnings are much more likely to be slow and steady without any major events worth breaking down. And if that does happen to be the case, then I probably will not make a separate video covering its earnings. And instead, I'll just give a brief summary of the highlights in the December monthly video. That said, if there is any noteworthy changes or interesting material worth going over, then a video will be made covering the report and conference call in depth but I just wanted to let you know ahead of time in case the earnings pass and a video doesn't come out. So if I do not release a Night Therapeutics video, it's just because everything has been going slow and steady and there isn't really too much to report on. Moving along, the next largest percentage gainer was the Morgard North American Residential REIT, who was having an amazing month post earnings up until Thursday hit and that gave up half of its gains. Despite the one-day drop, however, MRG shares still performed well, appreciating in value by 3.77% in the month. And the only real news that came out for the REIT in October was its earnings. But those earnings were very good, with both average monthly rent per suite and occupancy seeing strong increases across the board. Those came alongside an increase in funds from operations and an increase to the tangible book value per share which, as of the end of the quarter, climbed to over $50. In addition to that, we learned that the REIT expects rental demand to continue to be strong, which should boost AMR even higher over the coming quarters. Finally, because the REIT performed so well, the management decided it was time to increase the dividend by 2.86%, taking it from an annual return of $0.70 cents up to $0.72 cents per share. These results were even better than I had hoped for, since two of what I think are the major contributors to Morgard's bargain share price are the worries about the real estate market and the recent lack of dividend raises. So in this quarter, Morgard basically just checked off both of those boxes. And that's the summary of what happened in Morgard's third quarter. If you want to get the full in-depth explanation and breakdown, then I did make a video specifically going over pretty much everything. So feel free to check that out if you're interested and haven't already. Last up was MTY Food Group, whose shares shot up by 7.41%, and this was on the back of earnings that the market deemed to be very negative, hence the drop right at the start of the month. But, in my opinion, this was way overblown, and all of the cited major concerns regarding labor shortages, supply chain issues, and the impacts of rising inflation were clearly outlined in both the Q2 report and conference call, and should have been expected to have an impact in the third quarter's results. That said, I did make a video covering all of this in detail, which you can also watch for a full rundown. But, like Morgard, I will quickly be highlighting my main takeaways. First, revenues increased in a big way, thanks to the return to pre-pandemic normalcy on the Canadian side of the business. But, because of the previously mentioned issues impacting the costs of running the business, expenses did nibble a bit on the free cash flow. 
noting that this decline was also somewhat overstated, due to one-time acquisition-related costs, as well as pandemic-related wage and rent subsidies that were suppressing costs in Q3 of 2021. This meant that free cash flows per share looked comparably worse than they should have. Still, the number that was reported was by no means bad, especially considering the current headwinds facing the company. Next, we received the management's plans going forwards with the Barbecue Holdings acquisition, where it was announced that MTY was already working on the expansion of the Famous Dave's Village Inn and Barrio Queen banners by creating smaller franchisable concepts throughout the United States. Finally, we got an idea of the management's capital allocation plans going forwards, and it was strongly suggested that they would be focusing on paying down the debt and continuing to aggressively seek out additional acquisitions. In short order, just a couple of days ago, it was announced that MTY would be buying out Wetzel's Pretzels for 207 million US dollars. Unlike Barbecue Holdings, however, Wetzel's Pretzels is not a publicly traded company, which means that I will not be able to access their financial documents. Thankfully, we did at least get some important information that I will cover in this video. I will not, however, be making a separate video for this acquisition, because all I really have to go off of is a single press release amounting to only a handful of short paragraphs. Now, this acquisition was by no means a small one. In fact, in terms of dollars paid, it's virtually identical in size to the Barbecue Holdings acquisition, which at the time, I called huge. Well, now they've doubled that in order to buy a pretzel company. But, not just any pretzel company. See, Wetzel's Pretzels is the clear-cut number two pretzel brand in America, with over 350 locations, 90% of which are franchised. On top of that, in the release it was mentioned that Wetzel's is free cash flow positive, and that the company is earning about $245 million in revenue per year. Now, unfortunately, we didn't get specifics as to how much cash makes its way to the bottom line, but I'd imagine that the pretzel business is pretty high margin, since the main ingredient is flour, which can be bought by the pound for less than a fifth of the price that a single basic pretzel is sold for. That said, there are definitely a lot of other cost-related factors that do have an impact on profitability, so we'll probably have to wait until next quarter's report to get a clearer picture on how highly Wetzel's Pretzels was valued in the purchase. Personally, as a shareholder of MTY, when I saw the headline stating that another $200 million deal was announced, I was initially a bit worried as to how the company was going to finance this deal, since, subsequent to the end of last quarter, the company had less than 100 million Canadian dollars available in liquidity. In addition to that, I believe that MTY's current share price is very cheap, so the idea of management potentially diluting my ownership in the company in order to buy out some other company would be far from a cause for celebration. Thankfully, the management negotiated for an additional $300 million that will be added to the revolving credit facility, and the Wetzel's Pretzels deal is going to be a pure cash buyout. So, believe it or not, after the completion of this deal, MTY will still have liquidity in the ballpark of 100 million Canadian dollars, which means that we could see another acquisition in the near future. Plus, the management let us know that the deal will be done on a cash-free, debt-free basis which just means that when the deal is complete, MTY will not be taking on any of Wetzel's cash or debts. Finally, we were told that this deal is expected to be completed sometime in December. So, very exciting news there, but I still need to see more of Wetzel's financials before I let myself get too optimistic. Also, with the size of this acquisition and the amount of debt that will be taken on, I'm now much less confident about a dividend raise being announced next quarter. That said, because of how much free cash flow MTY's operations are able to generate, I don't think that this higher level of expected debt is much to be concerned with. And the absolute last thing that I want to touch on this month is that MTY's total retail products offered dropped by two according to the grocerycollection.com website. And that's all of the portfolio specific news for this month, so let's transition into this month's gains, which feels kind of weird saying after so many declining months in a row. Anyways, as of the end of the portfolio's fiscal October, the value of the holdings is now sitting at $928.31. This represents an unrealized loss of 8% on the dot, which isn't good, but at least it's a step in the right direction. 
As for the benchmarks, in October, all of the ETFs that I tracked had positive results, ranging from gains between 2.66% and 6.08%. So in terms of the monthly comparison, I actually managed to outperform all of them. And there was no mistake this time. I double and triple checked everything. Noting that, I did just barely nudge out the global value ETF by 0.05%, and this time the competition did not get any help from dividends. That said, this month did have a couple of extra variables, like that big acquisition rate at the end of the month, which came practically alongside the Fed announcing more rate hikes. So who knows how the portfolio would have performed if either of those unpredictable events had have been different. Going over to the total values, my portfolio is still the worst performer of the group, and it's still by somewhat of a large margin, with the next worst performer being the S&P 500 ETF, which is worth $29.78 more than my portfolio. Meanwhile, the best performer continues to be the global value ETF, which is the only one out of the group that has currently surpassed the break-even mark. And, looking here, you can see that the global value benchmark is starting to separate itself from the pack. On the other side of things, my portfolio has continued to linger behind, but at least some progress has been made even when comparing against my monthly goal line, which represents a 12% annualized rate of return. Last month, I was lagging behind it by over 13.2%, and this month, I'm only trailing it by 11.15%. So, I'm still quite a ways off from the long-term target, but it has been a rough year, and I am starting to move in the right direction. Plus, I'm very happy with my holdings going forwards, and I'm still of the belief that in the long run, I will outperform the indexes and my annual goal line. Even still, I do feel obliged to remind you that since inception, my portfolio has only been active for about 10 or so months, and with the relatively small number of holdings, there is bound to be a good bit of variance along the way. It just happens that at this moment, the variance is not positive. Noting that, I am confident that this will turn around, and that the prices of my holdings are still very cheap. So, that's all there is to say on that, and now it's time to invest this month's capital, since I've already deposited the $100 of contribution, and I also have $2.16 in dividends that I need to invest. My plan for this month is going to be pretty much identical to last month's. Morgard shares are still trading super cheap, considering their earnings results and expected future performance. Meanwhile, I still have a few questions regarding MTY's recent acquisitions, but I do think that over the long run, it is set up to grow and compound quite rapidly. Finally, I think that Knight Therapeutics is probably the closest to fair value of the group, though I do still think that the business model and management's capital allocation expertise is being discounted. So, this month I'm probably going to be buying 5 shares of Morgard, 2 shares of Knight Therapeutics, and the remainder will go towards MTY Food Group. So that's the plan. Now I'm going to hop onto the Wealth Simple account and show you exactly how things turned out. Okay, so I'm here inside the portfolio. We have the $102.16 to spend. Let's start with Morgard. So we're going to buy our five shares for market price. There we go. Next, we're going to buy our two shares of Knight Therapeutics. And finally, a remaining $13.94 of MTY shares. So let's buy that. And I'll be back when that goes through. Alrighty, I'm back and I've successfully received five shares of Morgard for $15.48 each. I've also received two shares of Knight Therapeutics for $5.41 each. And finally, I got a notification that I successfully purchased 0.2432 shares of MTY Food Group for a price of $57.31 per whole share. Now, as of the market close on Friday, November the 4th, the portfolio holds 48 shares of Morgard worth about $739, approximately 2.95 shares of MTY Food Group worth nearly $170, and 22 shares of Knight Therapeutics worth about $118. Also, there was no cash left over in the account after the purchases. 
Transitioning over to the dividend tracking portion of the video, October was a return to the trend of achieving higher distributions on a month-over-month -month basis. And October's $2.16 in earned distributions was the largest amount received in a single month for the portfolio since inception. Next month, the portfolio is projected to do even better by setting another record with $3.08 in expected distributions, coming from roughly 2.7 shares of MTY and 43 shares of Morgard, which were held on their respective ex-dividend dates. Cumulatively, the portfolio has now received $11.15 in total dividends, so the dividend growth is really starting to ramp up. And while we're on the topic, I do want to clarify that yes, Morgard did announce a raise to their distributions, but this raise is expected to take place following the next ex-dividend date, so Morgard will not be paying those higher distributions until December rolls around. Now, with regards to this dividend hike, I have decided to both include the standard yield and the raise-adjusted yield to the yield on contribution chart just to show how this raise will affect the current portfolio's expected performance, assuming no other changes to the portfolio occur over the next 12 months. Accounting for Morgard's distribution increase, I can now expect my portfolio to return roughly $37 per year, which is about a dollar more than without the raise. Also, the higher payout does bump my yield on contribution from 3.61% up to 3.7%. This isn't a super huge difference, but Every dollar does count, and the portfolio is now yielding enough money to essentially give me a little bit over an extra third of my monthly contributed capital every year, which I can use to reinvest into more shares, which will in turn give me even more money. So I'm just going to let that compounding continue, and before I give my usual spiel, I thought it would be fun to show what the portfolio's income could actually buy. And currently, I'm earning enough money from my investments to either buy a McDouble or a Junior Chicken off of the McDonald's dollar menu once per month for the rest of my life. So clearly, I don't have that much buying power at the moment, but every month brings the portfolio a little bit closer to achieving that dream and goal of financial freedom. That said, please be aware that this video is not financial advice and that I am not a financial advisor. This video was made entirely for the purpose of providing inspiration and insight into my personal investment decisions, and it should not be used as a substitute for doing your own research. This video does not have the information required to make good investment decisions on individual securities. So again, I am not a financial advisor, I am just a Canadian who likes to invest and share my opinions with others. And in doing so, I hope that I was able to provide you with something of value. And if I did, then please consider sharing it with anyone else who may also benefit from it. Thank you for sticking with me all the way to the end, and enjoy the rest of your day.